at um, cases of the coronavirus are, are on the increase here. And there are so many people that are sick already. So we pray for healing for those who are sick, that you would reach out your hand and heal and save. And we pray for Even though he's sort of exposed, he's just by himself up here today. Uh, we pray that you would just empower him. Lord, I pray for us as we gather with just not many people here, Lord, that we would um, that we would focus on you and on your goodness, Lord, and on what communion means and what being partaking of one body and uh, one bread, one one cup, what that means for us as Christians and the way we relate to each other. We love you. Pray that you would bless our efforts as we try to feed the hungry. Pray that you would bless our efforts as we try to fellowship and give people a, an opportunity to be in community with, with each other and have accountability with each other and encourage one another and uplift one another that you would bless us. We love you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand and sing with me this morning? Sing this doxology together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above you. Heavenly host, praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen.
thanksgiving this morning. I choose this day to be grateful. I give you praise with an open heart. I'm waking up to
my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still and all alone. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore. For endless days We will sing your praise Oh Lord, oh Lord our God Then on the third At break of dawn The Son of Heaven rose again Oh, trample death, where is your sting? The angels roar for Christ the King. Yes. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forever. sign shall pierce the night and I will rise among the saints my case transfixed on Jesus face Oh 
will praise your name forever. And we will see you face to face. We will see you face to face. No more sorrow, no more pain. No more strife, no more division. When we're looking at our Jesus, and we will praise your name forever. we praise you. God, we put our hope and our trust in the name of Jesus Christ, and we worship that name. I pray you would show us a glimpse of your divine beauty and your glory, Lord. Just a glimpse. Let us taste and see who you are and your goodness. Father, I pray that you would prepare our hearts now to take communion as Jeremiah comes up. God, that we would just feel a closeness to you and to each other and that we would come to a deeper realization of this life of what living in communion and repentance and praise looks like Lord oh we love you and we look forward to praising your name forever For communion starting this Sunday, and one of the reasons is because we, we really try to be intentional with the way we do things, um, with the order of service especially, and we like to kind of go into communion with uh, with something that we, like we're just saying, that kind of um, highlights the, the finished work of Christ, and when we come out of communion, we like to uh, respond to that, to that work with praise and thanksgiving, and so uh, putting the offering uh, after communion uh, almost looks like we're responding in praise and thanksgiving to the text to give. Um, and that's not what we want to uh, praise at all. Um, and so this is an opportunity for us to support the, um, the local church, the work of ministry, the gospel. And we have a number of ways that, uh, that you can do that. And one of them is to text any dollar amount to 84321. Really simple. You just text how much you want to give to 84321 and uh, follow the prompts and they take care of the rest. So that's a really simple way that you can um, support the church and the work for the gospel's sake. Or you can drop um, money or a check in the basket on your way out. And we do want to take this opportunity to thank everyone for their gifts, especially in uh, times like, like these. We know that anything that you give um, is a sacrifice, and we understand that for a whole lot of people, the income is not what it was, and the Lord has blessed us through your generosity. Uh, we've met budget every month except for one month, I think, and uh, so we are very, very thankful for the sacrifice that you make in supporting this church with your with your money. Uh, if it weren't for your financial offerings, we we wouldn't be able to do the things that we that we do to the capacity that we do them. And so we, we want to thank you for that. And we also want to praise God right now in prayer uh, for, for the generosity that he has shown through you. Let's pray. God, thank you for, um, for being so good to us and so kind to us. Your mercies are indeed new every morning. You make it rain and you make the sun shine on the just and the unjust on the good and on the wicked. And there's no love like your love. And there's no love especially like your electing love that you have that you have bent and shown those of us who are your children. So we thank you for all that you've given us in Jesus Christ. We're thankful that you have met our needs monetarily. 
as a church. Lord, I pray your blessing on the people that are, that are giving this morning, that you would be generous to them, um, that as they, as they give, you would give so that they may abound, as Paul says, for every single good work that you put on their hearts. Lord, that you would actually supply the very thing that you demand. We know that you do it with every reality, with faith and with hope, um, with our obedience, and you do it with money too. And so we pray that you would do that for the people who are giving, Lord. And I pray that you would give us generous hearts. Thank you for the generous hearts that have already supported this church, supported your work. But I pray that your word would go forth, that people would bow the knee to Jesus, that we would be uh, culture setters, Lord, that, that the culture that we build in our homes, in our family, in the church would expand just as your glories cover, your glory will cover the earth as the, as the water covers the face of the sea, that, that you would help the way we live and the way we look at life and the way we view reality as a church, as a body, to spread to our neighbors, to our friends, and impact our communities our states, our nation, and this entire, this entire world. We love you, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we have um, a little cup here uh, that we're going to, well, this one's been used. This is a, you know, we have a little cup here, and um, it is, it's got bread and juice in it, and it's double layered, and so you'll peel off one to access the bread, and you pull off the other to access the cup, and we'll do that together as a body, and um, and this is for believers, and, and we're going to see why in 1 Corinthians 10, and um, and we, we try to make that clear because um, I, think it's, I think it's clear from the text in 1 Corinthians 10 and 11, but before we take, I just kind of want to set our minds on what communion is and what the act of communion and the emblems that it contains says about our identity um, and the way we re should relate to each other. Before the coronavirus, we were just marching through 1 Corinthians. You know, some of you remember it, some of you don't. Uh, we got to 1 Corinthians 10, actually, um, and then through prayer, we just had to kind of pivot to some of the needs that people felt um, in the middle of the pandemic. 1 Corinthians 10, just to kind of set the stage for you, the Corinthians are um, eerily similar to us. They, they're very tribal. They like things their way. Um, if, if, you, uh, if you were to offend one of them in a business dealing, they would take you to court and sue you. Um, you know, we get on Facebook and run you down. They take you to court and sue you. So well, I don't know what the difference is. But, um, and, and Paul is trying to press into the reality that there, there is a better way there's a, there's a better way to live than looking after your own ambitions and your own selfish desires. And that way is the way of Christ and the way of the crucifixion and what that crucifixion means to us. So in 1 Corinthians 10, there's an issue about whether or not they could eat foods offered to idols. All right, That was the big argument in the church's day. And, and Paul is going about trying to to, to clear some of that up. So that's the context. And this is what he says in verse, four, verse 14. He says, Therefore, my beloved, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 14, flee from idolatry. I speak, to, I speak as to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in in the body of Christ. Now, you got to follow Paul's logic. He's, that's why we say it's belief for believers. When you take of the bread and of the cup, it is a, it's a participation in the body of Jesus Christ. It, there's a connection that's there. It's not something that's just separate. This is what we do. There, there is somehow, some way, by faith, a participation when we take of the bread and of the juice and in the, in the body and in the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He goes on to say, because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. It's very, very, very important 
what, what Paul just says. Because we partake of the one bread, there's one body, one bread. We are partakers of the same body. We are all one because we all partake of the one bread. Consider the people of Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifices participants in the altar? What do I imply then? That food offered to idols is anything or that an idol is anything? No. I imply that what pagan sacrifice they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You can't partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Shall we, per- shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? So Paul's main point, the thrust of his argument is, it doesn't matter whether or not the God behind the idol is real. That's not the point. The point is, what is real is that when Christians take communion, they partake, they are participants in the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. That is, in fact, a reality. That is the most important reality to Paul. Because they are one with Christ Jesus, because they are participants with the body of Christ, they take, they've taken from the altar, just as the Israelites did, they are eating from the altar, they are participants in the sacrifice, the sacrifice, they become one with it. They can't eat the food that's offered to demons because they are one body, because they partake of one bread. Now, that's simple enough. Right? It's, it's very hard to kind of practice this because the church is experiencing in these times, I think, a, a really, really um, stark divide politically. So in Corinthians, the divide was one of popularity. I'm a Paul, I'm a Cephas, I'm a Paulus. But in, in these times, it is the divide is one of it's one of politics. It's it's who you support, what policies you support, how fervently you support them. And, and churches are splitting. People are leaving churches because of a church's political lean. And the fact that a church has a political lean at all shows the absolute absurdity and sadness of where we are as people as the body of Christ, as the kingdom of God. So, there's a different way. There's something that's required of us as members of the body of Jesus Christ. And Paul says what it is in verse 23. This is a Corinthian slogan. All things are lawful for me. In Christ, I'm freed from the curse of the law. All things are lawful for me. That's the way they think. This is Paul's response to all things are lawful. But not all things are helpful. He's trying to get them to think in a different category. They're thinking in category of rights. I have a right to eat or drink. I have a right to take my brother to court and sue him because he cheated me. And Paul says, stop thinking about life in terms of what your right to do is. All things are lawful for me. But there's a category that stands over against lawful, right? And that is, not all things are helpful. Think in those terms. All things are lawful. Well, here's another one. But not all things build up. Then he says this. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. Why does Paul... Why does Paul say this immediately after this little short discourse on communion? Here's one of the reasons. What this represents, the death of Jesus Christ, this, this represents not only the act of crucifixion, the giving of Jesus Christ of himself as a sacrifice, It represents the emotions and the thought process behind that giving. Jesus didn't come and say, all things are lawful for me. Jesus came and focused on what was helpful. All things are lawful for me. Jesus 
did not act according to what was lawful for him. He acted in accordance with what was helpful for other people and what built other people up. He, in a word, did not seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. That is the essence of what this represents practically. Theologically, it represents the body that was broken and the blood that was shed. Practically, however, it represents the mindset of Christ that doesn't look out for its own good, but that's always looking for the good of others. Who doesn't do something for his personal gain, but does it for the good of others. And the reason I know that I say this with confidence is because of what we read about in 1 Corinthians 11. We're almost done. Verse 17. In the following instructions, I do not commend you. Because when you come together, it's not for the better, but for the worst. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And I believe it in part, or I believe the report. That's what he's saying. For there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. (laughs) You know, that whole fight. Well, let's see who's real here. You know, that's one of the first things that happens. When you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper that you eat. So he's, gonna, he's talking to them about the way they do communion. And he's got a problem with it, right? And the question is, is why does he have a problem with it? I want you to keep in mind, what does communion represent? It represents the body and blood of Christ theologically. And practically, it represents someone's life lived, not for his own good, but for the good of others. All right? But think about that as, you, as we try to figure out Paul's problem. When you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry and another gets drunk. That's what you call a division. One, one person has enough to get drunk on. The other person has so little they can't even quench their thirst. One person has so much that they become a glutton. One has so little that they can't can't even quench their hunger. And there's no mindfulness from the one that has a lot of the one who doesn't have anything. They're coming together and taking communion and they're seeking their own welfare. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Well, this isn't the purpose of the church, right? Not you can't eat and drink in the building. I've been around a lot of people that point to this verse to say that. Do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? That's the issue. What shall I say? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I will receive from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 1 Corinthians 10, 17. Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body. For we all partake in one bread. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So one of the greatest tragedies is that we can proclaim the Lord's death and practice the right way, but in our hearts, right, actually deny by our relationships with our brothers and sisters in Christ, the very thing that the act, the death of Christ, is supposed to represent. Unity in one body. A great unifier. One person who came and looked out, not for his own good, but for the good of other people. And what Paul sees as a tragedy here is they're coming and partaking of a meal that's supposed to symbolize the giving of oneself for someone else. And the only thing that's in view to them is what they have. And Paul says, it's so out of touch with 
what Jesus did on the cross, it's not even the Lord's Supper. They're calling it the Lord's Supper, but it's so, it's so off that it's not even the Lord's Supper. I can't even call it the Lord's Supper. Your actions are so out of whack with what it represents, you might as well be eating a meal in your home. This isn't what the church is. That's Paul's point. He says, whoever eats, whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. Whoever eats and drinks without discerning the body. Who is the body? Because we, what's he saying in 1 Corinthians 10, 17? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body. The, one of the main ways to take the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner is to not discern the body. It's to be so focused on yourself, on your needs, on if you have enough. And have that mindset drive every action of your entire life so that in the world, you're all about you. And then you walk into the assembly taking part in something that represents a person's act who was not about himself at all. That is how. You take this unworthily. That's how. Is when you don't discern in totality what this represents theologically and practically. He says, that's why many of you are weak and ill. Some of you have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. See where the judgment comes? Because they don't wait for each other. Waiting for each other is another way of saying discerning the body, being aware of who has what. Making this a place where, yes, we understand that there's a divide racially in our church, socioeconomically in our church, politically in our church. But those divides, they melt in the great unifying work of Jesus Christ and the cross. Because the thing that we have in common, which is our sin, is the very thing that he came and died for. And when we partake this, we proclaim that yes, he came and he died for my sin. And that this act represented a person who acted totally out of character in the human race. <laughs> He's totally out of character. He didn't do anything for the good of himself, but for the good of other people. And what he calls us to do as we partake this is to examine ourselves to see if we have that mind, the mind of Christ. It's not a sinless, a sinless examination, you know. Let me offer up one quick prayer. Lord, forgive me for being a jerk to my wife, you know. I want to eat judgment on myself. I mean, you should. I'm not trying to make fun or lie to that. But it's deeper than that. It's, it's a call to an examination of, okay, am I, am I so gripped by Christ's kingdom that I'm living a kingdom life, or I'm living a life that's just in step with the American dream. I mean, that's what the examination is. What's all this about? What's this for? Why do I work? Do I work so that I can have, and so that I can save, or so that I can keep? Why do I love my my spouse? Is it because of what she does for me? What the good I get from her, or from him? Why do I do the things I do at work? Is it because I want to be a people pleaser, move up the ladder? 
or do I work as to the Lord? This is an examination of motivation, the, the root that's behind the action, right? That produces the action. And the good news for us is there's an abundance of grace. There's an abundance of mercy. There is a weekly reminder of the way we should live in this cup. It's a weekly reminder of of what it represents, but also the attitude behind it. So let's pray together, and and then we're going to take of the bread. So if you want to pull pull off this top layer, we'll partake of the bread together, and I'm going to bless it before we do. Lord, thank you for this bread, which represents the body that was given for us, broken for us, the body of sin that Christ took on himself. The righteous died for the unrighteous so that he might bring us to God. And so, Lord, we, we hold this in our hands, thanking you for the death of your son. And we also hold in our hands acknowledging that this death was not done because we did anything to merit it or because we deserved it. Or because you looked on our hearts and saw that we were worthy of it. But this death was a gift, a free gift, given by a person, a a human being, a man, who did nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, who did not look after his own welfare or good, but only the good of other people. And Lord, we pray that you would make that, you would make us like that. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's pray for the cup. Hopefully you've ripped it off. Lord, we hold in our hand one cup, one blood, was shed for us. It represents the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for us. A lamb without blemish, without spot. That we couldn't buy with an abundance of gold or silver or precious jewels. That was not the cost of our redemption. We couldn't pay for it. It had to be offered. It had to be given. You had to present this lamb for this sacrifice. So we thank, we're thankful for the cleansing that comes from the blood of Jesus Christ, for being cleansed. And we ask, God, that you would continue to cleanse us, that it would be an ever-present reality as you say it is in 1 John. And that we would bear the fruit, not of a sinful life, but of a holy life, of a life redeemed, of a life ransomed. Thank you for Christ. And we pray this prayer in his name. Amen.
leave behind your regrets and mistakes Come today, there's no reason to wait Jesus is calling sorrows and trade them for joy from the ashes a new life was born Jesus is calling oh come to the altar the Father's arms are open wide forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ will come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus, Holy Spirit, God the Father. We're in awe of you, and we thank you, Lord, for the body and for the blood, Lord, broken and shed for us. God, I pray that we would take the word that we have heard this morning, that we would take it to heart we would be like a seed that grows there that takes root 
and it just changes our entire perception and the way that we look at things as only your word and as only your power can, God. Nothing has the power or the capacity to change things like you do, Lord. So God, I pray that as we leave here, we would each examine ourselves, that we would throw ourselves upon your mercy at the end of the day, knowing that we cannot correct ourselves, but we can only throw ourselves at the foot of the cross and behold our Savior and the life that he lived completely selflessly for others, that we can behold that, that we can believe that your spirit can come and change us, change our outlooks, and take away our hearts of stone and give us hearts of flesh, Lord. God, that's our prayer, that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit and that you would soften our hard hearts and give us hearts of flesh, Lord for the broken, for the outsider, that we would throw ourselves on your mercy and believe wholeheartedly in your power to sanctify and purify and cleanse us from every sin. Make us one in the name of Jesus Christ. And it's in that precious and holy name that we pray this morning.